we just get started and people come when they come, if they come? Yeah, okay. So this happens sometimes. Um, we're on John chapter 1, and the, um, did, did you get a Bible study? Yeah, you got that in front of you. So uh, we're going to start and then cover the, the text as it is in uh, the sermon today. So we'll get a little bit of overlap that way, but you can get some more depth always within the framework of, of uh, looking at a text. There's always so much more. You know, Jim knows that uh, you, you dig into a text and you wish you could unload everything you learn, even in a short study for a, as a pastor. You just can't because because if you, if you trace too many things and it, one of the leisures of being a preacher over a long period of time is you can take accents and you can you can look at that text through a different lens and then and then follow that lens and that's kind of what I'm doing today in preaching uh, using the light lens or the beacon lens you'll hear about that in the sermon uh, that's really epiphany so but but this text is put in epiphany uh, partly because the concept is that he's made known. He's made known to the world. And that's like turning a light on. Um, I'm in dangerous territory right now with my wife because uh, she, wanted, she wanted the uh, flooring changed. The carpet in the living room had gotten, has gotten kind of um, stained and wrinkled and you know, you can, you can try to fix it, and I've cleaned it bunches of times, but there comes a point at which you, you have to do something different. So we decided to put in wood flooring, and I've got the whole uh, living room empty. Our bedroom comes into the living room, and I've got wood down there, and boy, oh boy, I'm worried that she's going to stub a toe, and I'm going to hear about it for quite some time. Because the wood is, you know, it's in the way. And if you come out in the dark and you're, you're just following your path, you know. So you got to turn a light on. And uh, uh, that, what, the, what the value of being able to see is remarkable. We, we cannot even estimate, I don't think within our life, unless we've actually had some eye uh, disease, we cannot imagine what it's like not to see. Light is so critical to us. And then when you have the light turned on, look, the Lamb of God, um, we're, going to, we're going to watch John come alive as he discovers something. And maybe, maybe you're one of those early risers. Any of you early risers? There. Yeah, she is. Are you? You get up because she gets up and, and wakes you up. Okay. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see that. <laughs> right. Well, when if you're an early riser, you love watching the light come up, uh, you know, because uh, in winter, you're, I, I'm sure you're ahead of the light. You're waking up in the dark, right? And and the, the light will come up, and, and maybe you'll see like I do. Every once in a while, I have a deer in my backyard. I certainly have furry creatures scrambling. Some of them I don't want there. And the light comes up and it reveals what is out there. And we often make those discoveries. Might be after a storm. I had a storm uh, a little while ago, a, a microburst that knocked down 10 50-foot trees in my woods. Um, I've got probably 50 to 100 more trees that are probably all dead, at least 50 of them. So I've got a lot of firewood. <laughs> if anybody needs ash for firewood <laughs> and you don't mind bugs crawling, no, they don't have bugs in them. Uh, we've been burning, burning heavy, you know, for quite some time. So, All right, let's take a look then at uh, John 1, 29. We'll, we'll take that first section, 29 to 34. Um, sometimes I'll ask for readers. Um, I can talk, you know, I could talk and do this without uh, stopping. That's what pastors do. Once they get the, they turn the engine on, I can run the engine. But if, if you don't mind reading, Ben, will you take the first round here? Okay. 
Okay. Um, do you know what that translation? That's got to be NIV. EHV. With with Dr. Brug being around here, I would uh, assume that. I like that translation outranks uh, me uh, because he existed before me. That translation is a little more understandable in this context. So, and then the next one, go ahead and hit the next one as well. as the Lamb of God. Um, I'm going to start with the questions and then come back up to some of the stuff that's in those paragraphs. What did John mean when he called Jesus the Lamb of God? Let's just start in general terms and we'll, we'll focus in. Jim. That is a, a really good early tie, isn't it? The sacrificial system. Um, I only brush up against it a little bit in the sermon today, but you just identified Genesis 22 and the sacrifice uh, potential of Isaac and the amazing faith that it took from Abraham, given by the Holy Spirit, to accomplish what then became prophetical. Really, we call it a type of Christ, right? Because Isaac was put on the uh, offering altar to be sacrificed. And for Abraham, it was his whole future. Can you imagine? I, I've never been able to approach that text, uh, I would say legitimately, because I don't think I could sacrifice a child. <laughs> I mean, we can do some incredible things, but that might be one that, it almost feels a little offensive that God would ask that, doesn't it? And uh, it's kind of, kind of one of the harsh realities of that is up at uh, uh, Shepherd of the Hills in West Bend um, uh, congregation. Um, there's Good Shepherd. It's a real big congregation. Then there's kind of a mission congregation that started, and it's growing rapidly. And uh, we attend there an awful lot because of my uh, son is a member there. 18-year-old, highly involved musician, was killed last week Wednesday as he was coming back from skiing. Drunk driver, hit him head on. So tonight is his funeral. So, you know, when you have that awesome thing of losing a child, the family, I don't know them. I'm only kind of uh, tangential a little bit as pastor. I often was involved in those. I, I lived through some really tough tragedies in my 40 years of ministry, really tough. But this, that one sounds pretty, pretty rough, doesn't it? To lose an 18-year-old. And if I, if I strike any tones here at, at all, ever, uh, I will tell personal stories. I will dig in. I want to apply the Word of God to real situations. I don't talk artificial. So when we do talk about that, if I ever touch a fiber and you want me to back away or uh, just let me know because, because I'm not, I don't want to have somebody hurt so badly they can't even, you know, I'm afraid he's going to raise that. I, I will be very, very sensitive to it if, if it is a, a touch point for you because grieving is hard. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, 
And I think it's fair to say, as human beings, I don't know if we could, I could do that. But as God, you know, you have, he's got such a larger, bigger perspective and plan. It's just amazing that he would do that. And it becomes the, um, the beauty of his love on both sides of the equation, into the darkness of Good Friday and into the light of Easter sunrise. So. Okay, thank you, Jim. That was, that was uh, extraordinary. Now, from uh, Genesis 22, though, uh, let's build on what he, he presented. He presented a, a, uh, the concluding words were, Abraham turned and saw that the Lord had provided because the ram was caught in the thicket. We don't even know for sure that, that Abraham may have sacrificed on the very mountain. There's, there's all these scholarly dis disputes about where Jesus was crucified. There are some who would like to think that the altar was built in the same place where Jesus was crucified. Whew. Uh, you know, could God do that? Yeah. I don't know, though. This stuff in, in uh, Israel, modern Israel, is anything where it was originally. <laughs> they, they move things around all over the place because they can, you know, it's tourism. And uh, I, as I understand it, I've not been there, but as I understand it, there's several places that claim to be the, the actual burial place of Jesus. You know, that one gets higher billing than all the others but because it's uh, more sanctioned. Um, so the Lamb of God there, the Lord will provide. There's one more thing that we should probably tie together in Old Testament history so that we get Lamb of God. Why a Lamb? What was the significance? That would come out after Abraham. Yeah, Passover. It became the central activity of the Passover that because there's a sacrifice... Because life needs to be given in order to pay for sin, then would come the blood of that life given as a protection. To think, and in some ways it's pretty bizarre to think that you would paint blood over a doorpost and then sit under it like it's an umbrella a protection. Now, I'm sure all of you have hit some, some weather condition that was just over the top, and whether it was wind or rain or hail. Have you ever been, been caught in hail? Uh, driving? Sure, I would. Yeah, yeah. Just black would be good. imagine going trying to go out into uh, uh, golf golf ball size we did get hail damage that, that uh, messed up my car and a little bit of the roof uh, in June of 20 I think it was June of 20 we're not so far north I, but our weather is probably just enough different that the Racine probably didn't get it but it got to golf ball size I had I had 12 I gathered 12 of them you know golf ball size and that does a pretty good number on your you know, on your car. So, so you know, to have protection, yeah. You know, now that's just an analogy. What if the what if the uh, size of the you are truly a friend? Thank you. Um, what if they they were baseball size or softball size, and they're coming down, and they apparently have gotten almost that large, and they can crash windows on cars, they can kill people. And if you had that in, in a size of a hailstorm and it was that oppressive, you would want some protection. You would want it immediately. Uh, so in that sense, the coming of the angel of death and the, the, the sprinkling of the blood is the key to understanding the look, the Lamb of God, there's our protection. What does the Latin phrase "Ecce Agnus Dei mean? The Lamb of God. Yes, it is. Behold the Lamb of God. 
Um, in, in the classical, some will, will uh, use the, the etchy. I've heard them uh, on video. They'll, instead of using the hard Cs, they'll say etchy, uh, which means behold. And ag agnus, is that the lamb or, or God? That's the lamb, and A E is God. Um, notice, you can tell that, uh, that this is a conscious person, pastor, who uh, knows the, the water of life for seeing campus. The next question is, where is it written? Yes, yeah. And there is a lamb with a banner, and the banner has on it, Eche Agnus, Eche Agnus D. Yeah, and then, right, right? Isn't that funny that you could have a detail like that that uh, comes out maybe, uh, you know, one of the things that, that it's nice to have symbolism, but the symbolism should be real, you know, and, and graspable. Um, you know, that's true. We, we will forget it if we, you know. some revelation with that crown up there, you know, because you've got Revelation 4 and 5 where the lamb shows back up again. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that, okay, that's what it is. It is the revelation one, yeah. See, you have, you'll have some history that I, I'm, I'm uh, Johnny come lately to. How did John know that Jesus was who he said he was? Yeah, according to the text, it was revealed to him. Now, obviously, cousins probably knew each other, but maybe not like we have. My kids actually have gotten, my grandkids love their cousins, and they like to play, and they play hard, you know. And my Minnesota grandkids come over, and they'll stay with my, uh, Nani and Baba, that's me, and, and they'll get to play with those cousins. So I don't know, did Jesus get to play with John as they were growing up? Maybe. We just don't have that in, and you got to be careful to speculate too much on it. Was he ever introduced to him? We'd like to say yes. We'd, we'd say, you know, it is totally possible that they didn't because uh, you do have Elizabeth and, and uh, uh, Zechariah down in Jerusalem area, Jesus up in Nazareth. That's a fair distance in those days. Um, but the re revelation... Pretty significant. Any any observations on that? That that John John now knows. He even says, "I know that he's the Messiah." To me, I always felt that he John was like prepared you know, by God for his mission, and uh, I don't know that you could. It, that could easily be done saying by saying, "Hey, that's your kid. I need to play in the mud." Yeah, we, we do want to be a little bit careful to interject, you know, uh, the hop, skip, and a jump, uh, it's 30 miles away. Well, that doesn't seem, you know, when I came down here at 50, over 50 miles today, you know, it's, it seems like nothing. So we, we do interject our own time frame on those. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but that's significant that John knows it now as the ministry begins. Because now, uh, and you said something that I will pick up on, 
and uh, talk about, and that's, that's going to be part of the theme, is that John was to point the way to Jesus. His entire role, which lasted very short, you know, Jesus, he's, he's six months older, the best we can figure out. He's six months older because, again, as he was being born was when Elizabeth was noticing and, and com, uh, communicating about the, the child of my Lord, right, coming to be by me. So there's a, a gap of about six months. So John is older. Um, and if they start ministry at 30, then John would have only been in ministry for about a, a year total, maybe. It's not very long. Think about that. It goes by pretty fast, doesn't it? But he had a great deal of impact because of being out in the desert. So, Any other thoughts uh, on this first part? Um, what we have up there, the Spirit coming down from heaven, remaining on him. Um, the one who sent me to baptize with water... So he even talks a little bit more about his role as uh, a pastor being the baptizer. I could go into quite a bit of length on John the Baptist, baptizer. I won't. Uh, it actually is a bridge from an Old Testament cleansing ritual. There was a cleansing ritual, but it was not the same as our baptism. Not at all. Our baptism is now captured by uh, Jesus and cleansing. Whereas it, it, it was a cleansing ritual, but it wasn't quite the, the, the same. Uh, I would say baptism is 10 times as strong. John contrasts himself, I baptize with water with Jesus, baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Now, um, let me just ask if you've, you've uh, it's been a while since I've talked about some of the Corinthian stuff, but what do you think of when you think of baptized with the Holy Spirit? In modern day, yeah, Jim, Jim probably, it was much more when we were coming through. Uh, it isn't as big a topic today. When we were coming through Semen, and uh, it, glossolalia is the Greek word for speaking in tongues. And I actually uh, was able to procure a 78 disc, that dates me right there, doesn't it? That had glossolalia recorded on it. And we took it to the STEM, you know, uh, uh, dorm room and played it. And, and we just couldn't believe our ears. You know, it, it sounded like um, somebody who was trying to get on to Star Wars. You know, here's, here's uh, Pastor Z's, you know, one of his favorite things to talk about. But it sounded like, that, you know, some other Klingon language or something, you know. Ay, ay. Um, Baptizing with the Holy Spirit is not at all that. How do we baptize with the Holy Spirit? All the time. Water and word, you know. And uh, boy, do I love to do that, especially with adults, to be able to find somebody that uh, is, uh, has, has been brought from darkness to light. Do you think the Holy Spirit was absent from John's ministry in baptisms? That's, a, that's an interesting question. From yeah. Well said, in fact, because I, I, I lost a young member to um, a ministry in Cedarburg. And he was from a strong family, but it was his wife that wanted to go there. And he had somehow figured out that it was okay because they would baptize infants if he asked. They called it an ordination, uh, 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 not an ordination, uh, ordinance. It was a command that you follow. See, we do something for God. We commit ourselves. The age of... of uh, either affirmation or when a child is, you know, they're, they're doing the work versus God doing it. Yeah, that's I've heard, well said. I've heard the word consecration used too. Yeah. I do like that simplicity of Luther, and he really did like, like baptism. I didn't ever adopt, I don't know what you did, Jim, in your ministry, 
Uh, Tony Schultz, have you ever seen him on Kids Connection? Tony Schultz from Watertown, Wisconsin. He's got to be about, was he pretty close to you in, in class? I think he was younger. Younger? Okay. All right. He's, a, he's probably a, a year or two older than me, and he's still going uh, in Watertown. Um, Tony would always take the baby in his arms, and he would do the baptizing while holding the baby. And I, I'd like to, you did, yeah, okay. Um, I'd like to, to let the, the role of the sponsors be the ones that hold. And typically, I would encourage that, although often now it's mamas won't give up that right because the baby won't, won't uh, you know, won't get in the right frame of mind to get baptized. <laughs> uh, but, but the question here alludes to the fact that John's baptism has been challenged. And even this concept of rebaptism, I'm sure you're fully fully aware that we don't rebaptize. We try to avoid rebaptizing someone. So we'll do research, investigate, and find out where they baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And was that within the context of the Triune God? Um, Well, and again, um, I think it's 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 okay to err on the side of making sure it's done. Uh, and when I encountered people, I did a couple of adult baptisms in the last five years, just because of that. They the broken family, divorced parents, and they didn't know for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the uh, point of John's contrast between water and the Holy Spirit? Or you could say, to make it more earthy, water and, not the person of the Spirit, but water and, he will baptize with fire. Yeah. And that's that Pentecost concept. Yeah, water and the Word. The Word brings it to us. It's the vehicle. But, but uh, one of the things that uh, historic Christians really understand is the tongues of fire coming at, at Pentecost, and that that is a, a sign of the, the Holy Spirit, the Counselor. Um, I was uh, able to preach. I, had, I did a wedding yesterday, and uh, it was on John 14, 27, Peace I Give You. And just before that, 23 through 26 are the words where he says, I will send you the Counselor. So if you put it into context, Jesus was mentioning the coming of the Holy Spirit as a peace bringer. How do you get the peace? Through the word and the sacraments. Yeah. All right. John was born before Jesus. So in what sense was Jesus before John? You know, in the confessions, that's, that, that's a mouthful. You're, you're a theologian. You just said things that, you know, wow. That's a mouthful. God before, from eternity. You know, God before time. Yeah. And and the um, all three of our confessions really, really stick that. Um, especially the Athanasian Creed. What was the first thing Andrew did after he realized that Jesus was the Messiah? Now, now I think we're moving beyond. Uh, next day, John. Um, volunteer for a reader, starting at 38. Gary? When Jesus turned around and saw them,
Praise be to you, O Christ. That's for sure. And uh, the first thing Andrew did. Yeah. He pointed, you know, where John was pointing. You know, come and see. Um, so Jesus had, it's kind of a, a, a double uh, thing. When the disciples show up at, at Jesus... They ask him where he's staying, and he's, he doesn't say, uh, you know, it's none of your business, you know. He says, come and see, and they spent the day with him. So that was pretty phenomenal. And then with the excitement, we have found him, meaning the Messiah. That's, that's incredible. Um, outreach has really only one uh, goal to accomplish. And that's to get out of the way of an introduction with Jesus, isn't it? To take somebody to Jesus and tell them, here he is. And then to get, get out of the way. And if only the church could do that more, more fluidly, that, that we, could, we could just uh, get people like Andrew. And, and can you imagine the excitement? Now, they went through a lot of ups and downs. The disciples, you read it, it sounds like our life. <laughs> But you also have, uh, at moments, some crescendos that are just, and this is one of them, the calling of the disciples. You know, Nathaniel will be another one, uh, and Peter will be another one, you know, because Andrew goes by his brother. So, yeah. Um, discuss specific people with whom you can share the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, if anybody has somebody that you want to share, uh, yeah, go ahead. And, and let me let me know that you've got somebody on your heart. Do, do you have somebody like that right now this morning? Maybe it maybe it's more private, and uh, you know. But I, I want you to probably would be good. Can you imagine if everybody left the church every Sunday with an intent to to do what Andrew did, to bring a person come and see with them. Um, we could fill the church pretty fast if we could double our numbers every week. If, on, if only, right? If only we could just double <laughs> every year. That's actually quite a bit of growth, right? No, almost no church does that. So, just the, the having somebody in your heart that you regularly pray for. I'm going to mention something as an application in the sermon and. Uh, uh, so I'll just briefly tie it in here. It's uh, from uh, the evangelism committee. Well, um, we did a workshop with uh, Eric, um, um, and mind blank starts with an R. Who is our current evangelism director of evangelism? Oh, it'll come to me. See, some timers. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> yes, five people, six people will know that I finally came to, yeah, uh, came to my senses. Yeah, sometimes is what we call it. But um, in, in uh, the, the 2020, right as the pandemic was happening, we were hosting and tri trialing a, a kind of a new curriculum for them. Uh, and I got involved with that and invited them to come in. We had to delay it, so we ended up not being the first, but the second congregation. And with that, they began a, a texting um, a concept you can just jump right on. And I get two texts a week uh, on uh, Friday morning at 7 a.m. On Tuesday morning at 7 a.m., I get a passage and a couple questions. And it's all mission-oriented. And it just is on autopilot. And what a nice prompt just to keep that in front of you. And it just came out of that little, little group, you know. So I'll mention that you can get that from, from uh, their, their office if you wish. Uh, Colossians 2, are, is that on there? What you do is just go to the, the slide for worship, right? Because it's there from worship. Good. It is. Um, volunteer for that to read? You got good enough eyesight? Go ahead. Therefore, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him by being rooted and built up in him and strengthened in the faith just as you were taught while you were over while you overflow in faith and in the spirit. See to it that no one keeps you captive through philosophy are in accord with human tradition, namely the basic principles of the world, but not in accord with Christ. For all the fullness of God's being 
you stop there because what we, we see is a distinction there between uh, application and appropriation. That is my words, fancy words for when we just listen about what Jesus has done and when we do something motivated by the gospel. Okay, so the first, that, that concept there, the fullness of God being, uh, God's being dwells bodily in Christ is a big part of what we have in Colossians. What encouragement does Paul give the Colossians and us in verse 6? Uh, ben, maybe you could back that up just for me. Yeah, there we go. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. The gospel of some will see the gospel as you and me. Not only is it clear to them, but to believe the word and by the way they do it, we draw them up to him. Yes, and it's it's gonna be that that would be the, the theme today that I would pull out. Uh, but but I do love the concept that, that in Christ you have, and that's that fullness on the next slide, you know, that he'll go right from the fullness of Christ to us having fullness. I mean, that, you know, he's, he fills us in every way, but, and he fills the whole universe, actually. It's kind of interesting how that word is used. But, but Jim is just drawing, drawing attention to the fact that uh, when you're filled with Christ, it spills out of you and uh, into, into the rest of your life. And people... Uh, will recognize it. Um, not all of us are given the context of, of nosy neighbors. Uh, not all of us have a lot of uh, overwhelming relationships with outsiders, some in work. Um, any of you work or did work with unbelievers? Well, that that's the most common interface is work. You're thrown into a relationship with somebody you don't even like. <laughs> <laughs> or you're trying to like or love as a child of God, yeah. Um, it can be acquaintances and neighbors, but, you know, in today's world, Ronnie and I were just observing that, that uh, neighborhoods are pretty disconnected, aren't they? I went to visit uh, Marianne Miko, uh, two blocks from the Racine campus, 91 years old. She's lived in her house for 56 years. And I think to myself how the world has changed from when she was... Uh, a neighbor there, and they knew everybody up and down the block. She's outlived the goodwill of the neighborhood, you know. <laughs> uh, so, how does Paul summarize the spiritual condition of Colossians and us in verse 7? It's a neat picture. exactly how it happens, doesn't it? Somebody that just becomes the, the, the recruiter. A lot of that is personality driven, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, I think extroverts will go uh, out and engage with other extroverts. They sometimes will bowl over an introvert. Sometimes an introvert, a quiet person, is the best uh, outreach person in, in the right context because they quietly uh, move alongside of somebody. And before they know it, yeah. That's exactly right, because I, uh, the, best, the best guy that I've ever had through that in prison was a guy that knew how to listen. And he would find people that were in trouble, and he would uh, buy them next to him and give them some space and some time, and pretty soon they'd tell him that this is telling them the problem, and they yep. ended up speaking the truth to the Lord. Guess what? That means I think we're at time. So um, I'll just I'll just close with a, a chuckle and then uh, then I'll I'll wrap it up. Is uh, I, I I didn't know that you let your your, your husband go to prison. You got to be. We may have to explain that. May, yeah, <laughs> I had to pick my husband up from prison. Yeah. My wife. I did a lot of jail ministry, and I use the term jail because it's a county jail. 
and uh, I had to explain that uh, to people because I would use it. It's just like it's just like when pastors say I married somebody. It sounds like I, I married an awful lot of people, and I have. <laughs> it's just within the context. We'll we'll close with prayer. Anything special in your hearts that you want to include in the closing prayer? We'll in, we'll include your special person or whoever you might throw into context for mission or outreach, and uh, just think about how we rely on the Lamb, how we hide under the blood uh, of the doorposts. And uh, again, the Passover is a most extraordinary, the more you get it in the Passover, the more you get what happened when Jesus gives us the blood of the covenant, which we'll take today. We are covered by the blood. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us just a little time to meditate in the word, to think about how you affected uh, the first disciples. John pointed to you, and then he pointed his disciples to go and walk along with you, and they did. And in doing so, they began a ministry of rescue. Thank you that you give us the gospel. Help us not to put it under a shade, not to hide the light, but rather to show the light in our lives and in our world today. Bless that uh, constant uh, um, desire of the Christian church to share the good news. Amen.